It's not like we can chop off his head to see if the pain goes away. Why not? Now how is House gonna functionally decapitate this patient? Very excited to be reacting to House MD Season 5, Episode 12, Painless. Requested by our first ever channel member, Joseph Randomness. Let's see if I can get the diagnosis before House does as a doctor working in London. I need an ambulance at 860 Oakland Avenue. I couldn't take the pain anymore. Oh, she did a great job reviving him, but if he had enough carbon monoxide in his system to cause a cardiac arrest, then I doubt that little chest massage would have reanimated him so quickly. The team are gonna think the obvious here, that this was a simple suicide attempt, but considering that this episode is called Painless, it seems like he might be trying to get himself out of some kind of unbelievable discomfort that he can't tolerate. Um, so what could cause intractable pain that is reversible? Most pain that's that severe tends to originate from the central nervous system. I remember that there was a case written recently of a patient with MS with reversible whole body pain because of one lesion in the parietotemporal area of the brain. It could also be other things like transverse myelitis or herpes zoster reactivation, rhabdomyolysis, hyperparathyroid crisis, perforia, DKA or Addison's disease. We're gonna need clues to narrow it down though. 32 year old male with chronic pain all over. Putting pressure on his pain helps, doesn't make it worse. He's got abdominal pain, severe headaches, muscle cramps that come and go. I do a pain profile to rule out psychosomatic pain. Search the home. Okay, so House is on board with Cameron that there isn't something quite right about this suicide attempt, although the rest of the team think the patient is just depressed. He's seen seven different specialists within the last three years and none of them can find something wrong with them. A real challenge. I like it. Now we can also add abdominal pain, severe headaches, muscle cramps to the mix. Interestingly, the car that he was trying to kill himself with was a classic car. That means he could have renovated it himself as a project, exposed himself to heavy metals in the process. Maybe that's what led to the neuropathy causing the abdominal pain, headaches, and muscle cramps he's got. Old cars from the 1970s still used cadmium in some of their parts. There was also lead in the batteries and mercury in the gas discharge devices. There is some potential there. He should have a heavy metal test to see if we're right. Do you think talking, interacting with other people actually makes it worse? We've seen that in other patients. Does this look like quail to you? Wow, okay, I'm starting to see the similarity between the patient and house. Both have chronic pain, both stuck on meds that don't really help, both get worse when talking to people. Is that why House picked up the case? Interestingly, they found that much meat in the freezer though, looks like enough to survive a nuclear winter. It's tough to get food poisoning from meat that's been preserved correctly like that, but Quail caught at the wrong time can be poisonous due to something called coternism. When quails migrate from north to south, they can consume a poisonous type of seed known as hemlock. Interestingly, that's the exact same poison that Socrates drank after giving the famous quote, the unexamined life is not worth living. This leads to acute rhabdomyolysis and muscle breakdown, which is visualized as elevated creatinine kinase levels. That could explain all the patient's symptoms, including muscle tenderness, extreme pain, headaches, and cramps. Cyclists and marathon runners can induce a similar condition when they overtrain as well. But here's a question for you smart people. Which salt would be elevated in the blood with muscle breakdown? Bonus points for why. Wild quail can be toxic, cause rhabdomyolysis, which would explain his pain, as well as the elevated CK levels. He's depressed because he's in pain. We're not diagnosing you either. Oh, he went straight to the heart. No messing around. House is a big boy though. He can handle it. I have to say, I'm not really a big fan of this new cast member, Chris Taub. He's played very well by the actor though, and seems to serve that job of being a strong contrarian that Foreman used to play, even though Foreman was a bit more likable. Taub used structured questionnaires to diagnose a patient with depression, and here's why psychiatry can be such a tricky environment. If your grandmother died one week before taking that questionnaire, then 
everyone would be diagnosed with depression. That's why if there's a clear triggering factor that's affecting someone's mental health, usually we call that adjustment disorder rather than depression. We'd be less likely to treat it as actively because there's a clear predisposing factor the person's likely to get better on their own within six months. Context is very important. So I agree with 13 that it's more likely to be rhabdomyolysis. But speaking of the importance of context, if you'd like me to react to a series and episode of your choice, then check out the channel membership. Members have their requests prioritized and get other benefits like early access to new videos. The first 10 members get their name on the Hall of Fame list that will stay on the channel forever and there are only six spots left so go check that out now so you can secure your place and the earlier you submit your request the earlier i can react to it press the join button now it's rhabdo push iv fluids check his urine do a muscle biopsy pp's down we need to get him in trinomber position we need a crash cart in here the q scan showed a pulmonary embolism the patient's looking very unwell now at this point what i would start wondering is how when this patient has been seen by seven clinicians for the last of three years, did they never find a problem? Now when he comes to house's team, all of a sudden he has depression, a pulmonary embolism, and a cardiac arrest, all in the same admission. Seems like house has been smashing mirrors for fun with that level of luck. The VQ scan is interesting as well. We rarely do those anymore, except for patients who absolutely can't have a CT scan, like pregnant women or people with kidney failure, for example. The VQ scan uses nuclear imaging to match areas of blood flow in the lungs with movement of air to see where there might be any mismatches and decide if there's a clot there. It has some advantages over a CT though. It's thought that many of the small microclots in the lungs actually are of no significance. And since there's little ventilation going on there anyway, and that's why we call some areas of the lungs dead space. But since you don't see ventilation on a CT, we would still end up treating for those clots and giving blood thinning medication. Even though it likely won't help a patient's symptoms, these small insignificant clots are called subsegmental PEs. That doesn't seem to be the case in our patient though, as he had a cardiac arrest, which means it was a massive PE. Thrombolysis would have been an appropriate option here, like using streptokinase or alteplase, and then anticoagulant for three months since it was a provoked pulmonary embolism that happened with this hospital admission. Now the patient could have a blood clotting disorder like antiphospholipid syndrome and factor V Leiden deficiency, protein C or protein S deficiency, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, hemolytic uremic syndrome or antithrombin deficiency. Other reasons for hypercoagulability could be cancer and he has a rare paraneoplastic syndrome because of it like Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome which could explain why it's worse when he's active could also be myasthenia gravis neuromyotonia myelopathy or stiff person syndrome like what Celine Dion has would definitely want a CT body on this guy and check the tumor markers what if it's a cancer syndrome like Trousseau's explains blood clots multifocal pain lack of obvious physical signs Check his chest, abdomen, and pelvis for tumors. Okay, so it seems like House and his team are going down a similar line of reasoning with paraneoplastic syndromes. The difficulty here though, if his pain is because of little clots in his terminal vet blood vessels, we would expect some skin changes like bruising or skin discoloration of some, some sort. That's why with normal looking skin and with the whole body pain, we really have only four options like rheumatological, metabolic, neurological, or psychiatric. Vascular would be way down on the list, but people don't always behave like they're supposed to. That's why STI clinics are so busy. There, along his diaphragm. That's not cancer. But we did find a demon in his intestines, air in the intestinal blood vessels, and house won't answer his phone. Isn't do an angioplasty on the superior mesenteric and find the other blockages. Air in the intestinal blood vessels. How on earth did that get there? There have only been a small number of case studies about that happening. And usually it would be after major trauma. I don't mean your team losing a match. I mean open heart surgery or being hit by a bus kind of trauma. Or it could be someone trying to kill him by injecting him with some air bubbles. So this is a very tricky spot to be in. 
I suppose you could argue that it wasn't an air embolism, it just looked like one but was actually a clot. It could be that he's got clots being thrown off from the diseased heart valve and infective endocarditis which causes a peripheral pain, pulmonary embolism and bowel ischemia. Let's see what their next test shows. These later episodes are so much more dense with investigations and storyline. I love how it's grown over the seasons. There is a storyline going on about 13 having Huntington's disease and how struggling at home with a falling roof. So much packed into one episode. Marks. Guessing from when he blew into his IV tube. Air bubble caused the PE and cardiac arrest. What about a glycogen storage disease like McArdle's? We're running an ischemic forearm test. Suicidal patients can be very creative sometimes. I remember when I was on the infectious diseases ward and we had a woman who kept swallowing batteries. They did her no harm, but we hit them anyways and one day she left the ward and found the battery recycling station. She was very pleased with her new supply and swallowed about five of them. All came out without causing a problem. That's because AA batteries aren't actually that dangerous to swallow, but button batteries are the dangerous ones. McArdle's disease that they were talking about is known as glycogen storage disease 5 because it causes an inborn deficiency of the enzyme called myophosphorylase, which helps glycogen be broken down into glucose. Since glycogen represents stored energy, patients with this disease are known to have reduced exercise tolerance red urine after exercise because of muscle breakdown and rhabdomyolysis which can cause raised creatine kinase levels which we saw at the beginning. To test for that you'd actually want to do a sample of creatine kinase, ammonia and lactate in the blood and do those blood tests again after blowing up a blood pressure cuff on the arm which obviously cuts off the blood supply to the arm causing it to rely on glycogen storage. Then you repeat the blood test afterwards and do a urine test to see if you've got myoglobin urea. Um, and this is just a screening test and then to confirm it would be a muscle biopsy. The treatment is with a high protein diet and activity moderation basically. Oh God! Pain jumped in my leg. It's never happened before. It's gotta be central. It'll still be peripheral. It's not like we can chop off his head to see if the pain goes away. Why not? What? House wants to chop off the patient's head to see if the pain goes away. Now how is House gonna functionally decapitate this patient? Could put local anesthetic into the spine from the neck down and see if the pain goes away. Um, but that would be obscenely risky since you can't access the space from the spinal cord that high up the same way that you can lower down and that's why we do lumbar punctures in the lower back or the lumbar region um, not in the neck. I suppose you could just anesthetize the lower limbs and see if the perception of pain there disappears. If it doesn't then you could say it's the brain. If it does then it's the peripheral nerves. This is going to be way off piece here though, nobody would be mad enough to do spinal anesthesia as a diagnostic test in real life. Seems like his ischemic forearm test was negative though, Taub thinks that it's a central nervous system problem because it jumps around too much, Kuttner thinks it could be multi-level disc degeneration disease, even though those discs would be very far apart from each other, one in the neck and one in the lower back. Now House wants to functionally chop off the head to decide where the problem is even though his MRIs have all been normal. Stip shot at lidocaine below the brainstem. Should numb him all the way down to his tippy toes. <laughs> some of the pain is gone but not all of it. What? How could it give some relief but not all? The nerve fibers that detect peripheral pain should be completely numb and if it's central pain they shouldn't have been affected. Unless it's a combination of both, which means that he's got lesions in both his spinal cord and his brain. Things that could cause that are B12 deficiency, poliomyelitis, paraproteinomic neuropathy, uh, conduction block neuropathy, myositis, celiac disease, or polymyositis. Could even be Lyme disease or HIV. Still be heavy metal poisoning with lead or mercury as well. Let's see. Since we're on the topic of the brain's perception of pain, I have a question for you. If you cut directly into the brain, would it cause pain? Drop your comment down below. Bonus points for why. I think 
He's faking. His idiot son distracted the orderly so that Daddy Deathwish here could down a bottle of isopropyl. Please do let him die. Oh, this is heavy. I find it so interesting what the writers have done here as a child feels so passionately about this. The reason why is because this child looks around seven years old, which is the exact age that children would no longer have egocentrism, which is believing the world is about them. It is also around the time when children appreciate the irreversibility of death. And before this, they do have some interesting perceptions about death. Children under five have little to no understanding of death and its permanence. And if they lose a relative, they can actually keep searching for them, thinking that they're coming back. Children who've grown up with a parent that's unwell tend to be much more outwardly mature than others of the same age, but they can be developmentally and academically behind because of the emotional and time impact of dealing with a parent's illness. I remember I saw a 28 year old female on palliative care who couldn't get her pain from metastatic ovarian cancer under control. And she came to the hospice for help from us and we had to give her 450 milligrams of oxycodone in 24 hours to finally get her to rest, which was two full syringe drivers of medication. She has an 11 year old child who was the bravest child I've ever seen. She's very inspirational. If she can stay positive in that situation, then surely we can stay positive when we face difficulties as well. We can't find anything because whatever injury caused the original pain healed a long time ago. The only thing left is the drugs. Oh, so house is onto something here. Opioid induced hyperalgesia. I was actually just speaking to William Johansson about this in the comment section recently, as he kindly shared his story about addiction. When you take large amounts of opioid painkillers, your pain receptors begin to increase in sensitivity and number to account for the dampening from the painkillers. That leads you to paradoxically feel more pain rather than less because of the painkillers. This is why addiction and dependence on opioids can be very troublesome and treatment is by eventually stopping the offending medication, which is through a detox. It's tough to do, but with the right support, it can be very effective. You can imagine that the pain would be excruciating after doing that at the beginning. Take him off the drugs. We can't cure him, so we're gonna torture him? Torture is the cure. Most men in your position have a deputy and two assistants at work and a wife and two nannies at home. What Wilson says here is quite insightful and impressive. I used to suffer from the same thing as Cuddy, wanting to do everything myself. That works up till a certain point, but then you hit a wall eventually, especially when you add like a baby into the equation, like she has fostered here. Something I can relate to as I'm gonna be a dad in April. It reminds me of what James Clear, author of international bestseller Atomic Habits says, create systems, not goals. It's turning up every day and improving 1% each time that will help you improve by the power of compounding. If you improve 1% each day, then you're actually 37 times better at the end of a year. That's backed by Chinese philosophy as well as Confucius famously said, it doesn't matter how slowly you go as long as you don't stop. For these reasons, I decided to hire an editor as I thought in the time it takes me to edit one video, I could be filming a second and focusing more on improving those videos rather than doing too much work. That lets me double my output for you to hopefully enjoy. If you're interested in listening to the Atomic Habits audiobook, then you can get it with a free trial of Audible in the link down below. Check that out. We'll be injecting you with naloxone. We need to clear everything. It's not your parents. And then it's your wife, someone your colleague. Person. Helped himself to a vial of insulin. Okay, so early in this episode, Taub was talking about how he would never kill himself because it's the coward's way out. And Cutner intuitively thought that there was a personal experience that led him to such a strong opinion. Now, Taub has shared that one of his colleagues that had a God complex tried to kill themselves in residency with a vial of insulin and survived, even though that traumatized his family in the process. 
That backstory does help us to understand Tab a little bit more and explain why he can appear so cold at times. Now, naloxone that Cutner mentioned they'll be using on the patient is a life-saving drug, but it's also insanely cruel. I remember that I was on cardiac surgery and a patient was unresponsive. The nurses couldn't wake them up or figure out why. When I went to him, he had pinpoint pupils and a respiratory rate of nine, which is classic for opioid toxicity. I gave him some naloxone and he woke up in a few seconds. Trust me though, he did not thank me for it because it reverses all the painkiller effects of the opioids in a short amount of time. And that's why we give the minimum dose immediately, which is 400 micrograms IV, and then we go on from there. It's not working. I know. I started him back on the pain meds. When I saw you, when I saw the cane, I thought, thank God, the doctor will understand. They say it only takes seven seconds for people to make their first impression of you and patients figuring out their doctors is exactly the same thing. Are they male or female, dressed more smart or casually, younger, older, mask, no mask. Each of these gives the patient an idea of what you might be like and patients want a doctor that matches their preferences for a particular situation. Like, my female colleagues get more period problems than I do because they're assumed to be more understanding since their doctor will go through it themselves. Similarly, I get more penis problems than my female colleagues. It's also assumed that since I'm a younger doctor, I will spend more time with patients and they can cover more problems. It's just human nature. Seems like our patient is still struggling and his wife has given up hope and wants to take him home. Maybe they'll go back to my heavy metal theory at the start now. Let's see. Testicles. What do they make you think of? The correct answer is epilepsy. Epilepsy doesn't cause chronic pain. So there were two types of seizure, generalized and partial. You can tell the difference because generalized causes loss of awareness and affects multiple areas of the brain and partial seizures are limited to one area of the brain, tend to not cause a loss of awareness unless they're complex and can have special characteristics depending on where they affect. Thinking about the history of epilepsy, which it seems like this patient has, it can be traced back to 4,000 years ago to a tablet in Mesopotamia inscribed with a description of a person with his neck turning left, hands and feet being tense and eyes wide open from his mouth froth is flowing without him having any consciousness. They described the most common type of seizure there, a tonic clonic generalized seizure. Historically, people used to think that this was due to an evil spirit that entered the body and needed spiritual intervention. Luckily, now we have drugs to do God's work for us. Our patient seems to be having focal seizures of the somatosensory cortex of the postcentral gyrus in the parietal lobe that senses pain. Give him a trial of anti-epileptic drugs and maybe the man will be playing catch with his son soon. Would have shown up on an EEG. Not if the seizures are in a place you can't see on an EEG, a place too deep in the brain, like the area that controls the muscles supporting the testicles. I love how they all just stand still in disbelief. What makes it even better is that House came to the conclusion while watching the contractor that helped him to commit insurance fraud itch his crotch. There you have it. That which gives life can save life. No wonder this show has won 56 awards, including a Golden Globe. Still... I'm feeling better. You busy tonight? She must be on the placebo then. Our patient is cured! Also, wow, so this is how Foreman's relationship with 13 started. He got her into a clinical trial for Huntington's, manipulated the appointment schedules, so her slot was after the patient with the best results from the trial, lied about it. Now he's found out she's been taking a placebo. Wow, they're really pushing the everybody lies theme here. But do they lie as frequently as the show says? No way, I don't think so. Still a brilliant episode though. Thanks to Joseph Randomness for the recommendation. Now it's my turn to diagnose you. Wow, it looks like you've got a house reaction deficiency. Go on, treat yourself. It's coming up here. I'm Sarah Stay curious.